thank you so much for coming. I'm Sandy, and I'm the lead engineer on the open source Dagster project. I work at Elemental, which is the company that builds Dagster and Dagster Cloud. I'm here to talk to you today about data pipelines. If you're a data engineer, a data scientist, a machine learning engineer, et cetera, there's a good chance that one of the main things that you do is building and maintaining data pipelines. What is a data pipeline? First of all, a data pipeline normally culminates in a set of data assets. A data asset is a file, a machine learning model, a table, any persistent object that captures some understanding of the world. The point of a data pipeline is to construct or update these data assets so they can be used to help make a business decision or power an application. To get to those assets, you're normally going to need to run some computations, pull data from external systems, run a Spark job, do some pandas transformations, train a PyTorch model, you name it. Those computations are usually going to consume and produce other data assets. So those other data assets might be source data, or they might capture some intermediate stage of the data transformation process. Unless you like to sit at your desk all day clicking buttons, you probably want the computations in your pipeline to run automatically. This aspect of data pipelines, automatically running them, is going to be the topic of this talk. How should you make the decision of when to launch a computation to update assets in your pipeline? And how should these decisions be expressed in software? To answer that question, I think we need to step back and answer a slightly more fundamental question, which is why run computations to update assets in the first place? Why add to your cloud bill? Why go to the effort? In my experience, there are a couple reasons. One is that inputs change. Data is typically derived from some upstream data. And when that upstream data changes or grows, we normally want to keep the downstream data up to date. Different source data changes in different ways. So some source data changes constantly. Maybe you run an online store, and new orders are coming in every second. Other source data changes at discrete moments. Maybe you have an external vendor that delivers a file to you every day, which contains the data corresponding to that day. The second factor is code changes. Data is derived using code, and if we fix a bug or improve that code in some way, we're usually going to want to update our data to reflect the changes in that code. And the third and final reason is that fresh data is needed by an application or analyst who's actually using the data. So if our upstream data is changing constantly, we're only going to look at a report once per day, then we might want to use this as a factor um, uh, to avoid wasting resources uh, by updating it constantly. For example, we might have an asset that we only need updated daily. Or for another asset, we might want it to, be, uh, in to incorporate new upstream data as soon as new data arrives. So there's a set of situations where we want to automatically update our data assets. How do we actually go about doing this? If you look at the last couple of decades, the answer that you'll probably end up with is with a workflow engine. Workflow engines are systems that take responsibility for executing a set of tasks in the right order. Airflow, shown here, is a very popular one. Uh, and the way it works is you basically define a DAG of tasks, and you put that DAG on a schedule. If you squint, this seems like a reasonable way to schedule data pipelines. Your data pipeline is a DAG, and you have this DAG of tasks. But there are some big problems which have actually personally caused me a lot of anguish in my years as a data engineer. The biggest one is that it makes the assumption that your computations should be running in lockstep. As we saw earlier, different data arrives at different times, and different data products have different freshness requirements. If you force everything to execute together, you get caught between a rock and a hard place of, on one hand, either running too frequently and needlessly updating data assets that don't need to be updated, or on the other hand, running too infrequently and data not being available when it's needed. And of course, you can split your DAG up into smaller DAGs. Then you have a whole extra dimension of complexity where you have to manage the dependencies between those DAGs, and you haven't even solved the lockstep problem within those smaller DAGs. A second related friction with workflow-based orchestration is that every time you add a data asset, you have to find a DAG to put it in to get it scheduled. This means you have to worry about, on one hand, whether DAGs are getting too large and unwieldy, or on the other hand, whether they're too small and fragmented. And then last of all, you get alerted when your task fails, not when your data is out of date, which is often what you actually care about. If the system can retry and self-correct before the deadline, then no one needs to get paged. 
So imagine we could throw workload engines out the window and design an approach from the ground up to orchestrating data pipelines. What would that look like? This is the topic for the rest of this talk. Our ideal orchestration system for data pipelines has a few goals. First of all, there are some important scheduling outcomes. We want data to be ready when it's needed, and we want to avoid redundant work. Second, as we saw earlier, our requirements for our data assets are the main determinants of when we want the computations in our pipeline to run. So we'd like to be able to express scheduling in terms of these assets. And then, last of all, we want to be able to understand the scheduling systems that our decisions that our system is making so that we can debug them when they don't go as we expect. We're going to explore this through Dagster, which is an open source data orchestrator. Dagster has traditional workflow-based scheduling, like we talked about earlier, but we've also recently added a new scheduling subsystem that's aimed at those goals that we talked about on the last slide. Something that makes Dagster uniquely suited to this kind of scheduling is that it views data pipelines in terms of data assets. So here's a one-slide primer on how data pipelines work with Dagster. Uh, shown here is a pipeline with three data assets, and it's defined using Dagster's Python APIs. Each of these decorated functions defines a data asset that we want to exist. So up here at the top, we've got an asset that's called events table, uh, and it's a table in our data lake that contains events that we've collected from our website. The code inside is the function that Dagster runs when it's, we tell Dagster to materialize the asset. By materialize, we basically mean run the asset, update it. Um, there's a few different words that mean the same thing. But materialize is, uh, is update this table in storage. It's not pictured here, but in this case, the actual code is going to read the event data from the location that it gets dumped to, and then write out a process version of the events table to the data. The second asset here is a table of logins, which is derived from the events table. And the decorated function has an argument here, which is just called events table, which, tells, which expresses this dependency. You can see that dependency expressed visually on the right, which is a screenshot from Dexter's UI. Um, and then last of all, we've got this third data asset that depends on both of the assets that we just discussed and uh, has dependencies that work similarly. The Dexter UI lets you manually materialize assets by clicking a button. And again, materializing just means running some computation to update the data asset. And which, that's cool, but the whole point of this talk is how can we avoid needing to sit at our computer every hour, every day, and click that button? How do we materialize this asset automatically at the right time? And so Dagster lets you specify this by adding what it calls an auto-materialize policy to the asset definition itself. An auto-materialize policy essentially describes when we want to update a particular asset. The most common kind of auto-materialized policy is what we call an eager auto-materialized policy. So that basically just means update this asset whenever the upstream data that it depends on get up gets updated. So in the case that's pictured here, Dagster is going to automatically update the logins table any time that the events table changes. And it's as simple as that. For assets that are generated as part of the Dagster data pipeline, it's easy to know when they've changed because Dagster is the one that's changing them. So Dagster can just uh, schedule this computation right afterwards. What about uh, the root of the data pipeline, though? Assets at the root of the data pipeline are usually derived from some data source, but that data isn't generated inside the data pipeline. In the example we've been working with, we have this events table asset, which is generated from events that get periodically dumped into some storage bucket by some other process outside of our data pipeline. Dagster lets us model that source data that we don't control with a special kind of asset called a source asset. A source asset is exactly what we just described. It's an asset that Dagster knows about, but it doesn't materialize. So in this case, it represents that storage bucket that the raw event data gets dumped into, but that our pipeline is not updated. Dagster then lets us write arbitrary code that checks this, uh, this bucket, or this file, or this table, and sees if it changed. So here's a code definition for the source asset we were just talking about. Like the assets that we looked at earlier, it's a decorated function. But the code in this function is not generating the asset. It's instead checking to see if it changed. So every time the code runs, it's going to return a version string. And if the version string is different than last time, that means the file has changed. We can set up this code to run at some interval, like every minute. And when it indicates that the asset has changed, Dexter will then auto-materialize any downstream assets that have eager policies. Dexter also has the ability to track code changes. Um, which can be used in a similar way, but I'm actually going to have to skip that for the sake of time. 
So we looked at policies that materialize downstream data as soon as upstream data changes. And that's useful in many situations, but in other situations, it's too often. So for example, you might have a data source that's changing every hour or even every second, but the downstream asset doesn't need to be that fresh, and updating it that often would actually be very wasteful. Or you might also have assets whose sole purpose is to power other data assets. And for those intermediate data assets, they actually never need to be materialized for their own sake. They only need to be materialized if downstream assets need them. So with a lazy auto-materialized policy, um, which is another kind of auto-materialized policy that Dagster exposes, um, instead of eagerly acting as soon as upstream data changes, you wait until the, uh, the data is actually needed downstream. Dagster expresses this idea of needed downstream with a concept that's called a freshness policy. A freshness policy is essentially a data SLA. It defines how fresh the data needs to be. So here we've added a freshness policy to our fraudulent logins model, um, which was the third uh, asset in our data pipeline. And it expresses that new source data needs to be incorporated into the model within a day of when it arrives. If it isn't, then the model would be considered, quote unquote, overdue. You can configure alerts, for example, when a model is overdue. So to illustrate what this looks like in a little bit more detail, here's a timeline. And in this case, our asset is considered fresh because after new source data arrived, materialization happened that allowed that source data to flow in the fraudulent, uh, into the fraudulent logins asset within the, uh, within the time constraint. And here's a case where our asset is considered overdue because it was not materialized in time. Um, uh, the data was able to flow some of the way, but the, the computation that updates the fraudulent logins model asset did not complete in time. The most basic use of freshness policies is for this uh, kind of reporting, where Dagster helps you understand if your data is overdue. Um, but the reason that they're relevant to this talk is that they can also be used for schedule. When you give your asset a lazy auto-materialized policy, Dexter will materialize it when doing so will help it or a downstream asset meet its freshness policy, like the freshness policies that we saw in the slides uh, just before. So once per day, uh, in this case, Dexter is going to notice that both of these assets need to be materialized in order to meet the freshness policy of the logins model, and then it's going to automatically materialize them at some convenient time. One of the situations where freshness-based scheduling really shines is when the same asset is upstream of assets that have different freshness policies. So for example, here we have a logins table that's upstream of both, both this logins dashboard asset as well as this fraud detection model. The dashboard needs to be updated hourly, but the fraud model, which is more expensive to compute, only needs to be updated daily. Trying to schedule this work with workflows gets awkward quickly. One option would be to use two overlapping workflows, so one that runs hourly and one that runs daily. But sometimes these workflows will run at the same time and will redundantly update that upstream asset twice we only actually need to do it once. Another option would be to have one DAG trigger another DAG, but only sometimes, like one hour of the day. Um, and a third option um, is you could try to handle it with skip logic inside a single DAG, where you all stuff it under. Uh, I personally tried all these approaches different times and many times, and found each to be difficult and dissatisfying in its own way. But with freshness-based scheduling, you can literally express this diagram in code. Um, using code that looks like uh, this code that we just looked at over here. Um, and the scheduling system will handle updating the assets on time without launching redundant computations. The last thing that I want to talk about before closing is observability. A scheduling system that makes the right decision 99% of the time is going to drive you crazy if you can't understand what is getting wrong in the other 1%. A scheduling system that makes decisions based on upstream changes and data freshness, is uniquely able to explain why it's making the decisions that it does, and explain uh, those decisions in terms of constructs that users and stakeholders are likely to be able to understand. Dexter takes advantage of this by displaying a history of all the scheduling decisions made for each asset. So for each tick of the scheduler, you can see the set of conditions that inform the scheduler's decision about whether or not to materialize the asset. Materialization conditions indicate whether there's any reason to materialize the asset. For example, new data has arrived upstream or um, uh, it's required for a downstream freshness policy. If no materialization conditions are met, there's no point in doing anything. And then skip conditions indicate whether there's a reason not to materialize the asset. 
For example, if we're waiting on other upstream data to arrive first, or if there's already an active backfill that's kicked off by a user that's materializing the assets, um, we're not going to want to materialize. So if any of these skip conditions are true, we skip materialization. Combined, these give a full picture of why an asset uh, is or isn't being automatically materialized and let you debug what's happening when you're not getting the behavior that you expect. Time is short. Uh, that's all that I have for you today. So, but I want to quickly sum up what we talked about here. So first of all, data pipelines are graphs of data assets, like files, tables, and ML models connected by computations. The computations inside data pipelines need to be scheduled, but workflows are not an adequate scheduling abstraction. Asset-based orchestration conceives scheduling in terms of keeping assets up to date, uh, which has a, a few big advantages. It allows expressing intentions more clearly, avoiding redundant computations, and understanding and, debug and debugging scheduling decisions. If you're curious about Dagster, you can check us out on GitHub, which you can get to by just Googling Dagster GitHub. Uh, we'd love to see you in our Slack, which you can get to from our website, dagster.io. Uh, and thank you so much uh, for listening. Uh, kind of find me after the talk if you have any questions, or maybe there's some way to do questions.